Brothers and sisters, it is indeed a very important topic. When the Prophet wasallam discussed important topics, he discussed them in such a simple manner that they were understood so easily by those who were around. Remember, at that time, people were highly intelligent. They were highly educated, but they were unlettered. There's a difference between the two. Unlettered meaning unable to read and write, the majority of them, but they were highly educated. They were very wise. They knew a lot and they progressed as life passed because of their following of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that was the following of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there is a very famous hadith that is known as Hadith Jibreel. If we hear the term Jibreel, Hadith Jibreel, we should know that it refers to one thing. It refers to an incident where the Prophet peace be upon him was seated with some of his companions and there came a man and this man walked in to this majlis, majlis meaning like a little sitting and gathering of some of the companions. And as he came in, subhanallah, he looked in a certain way. And this was described by the companions radiallahu anhum. They say we saw a man, he was very good looking. He was in white clothing, completely white in terms of clothing. And his hair, totally black subhanallah completely black so white clothing black hair and none of us knew him from amongst us which means he came from afar he came from somewhere far away nobody knew him from amongst us but at the same time there was no sign that he had undertaken a journey obviously what this would mean is if it's a person nobody knows they are from far and if they're from afar, there would be a little sign to say, you know what, this person has red eyes. Perhaps they have, you know, bags as we call them under their eyes. Perhaps they're looking a little bit tired and so on. Normal, because you made a long journey. But this man, no sign whatsoever. So he comes in and everyone's watching, looking. He greets, he sits down in a way that we sit towards the end of salah, known as a tashahud, right? When we sit, he sat in the same way. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was sitting in a similar way. So, I think this is disturbing me, my brothers. The, the, the feedback here is a little bit too much. Uh, so what happened is, subhanallah, he sat in a way that his knees were touching the knees of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That is very, very close, subhanallah. That is extremely close. And he says, he started asking questions. Oh Muhammad, what is Islam? Now everyone's watching, hey, this person, the way he's asking. For, for you and me, it would seem rude. But obviously the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were listening, watching, because they knew that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself was there. Let's wait and watch how the reaction is. Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, what is Islam? He says, Islam, and he explains the five pillars in brief. He says, to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah, and that I am the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to fulfill your salah, and to, to give your zakah, and to fulfill your fast in Ramadan, and to go for hajj, if you are able and capable. Man istata'a ilayhi sabilan. Whoever can go, and whoever has the means. So he says, sadaqta, which means you have spoken the truth. So the sahaba radiallahu anhum are looking at this man, and they are thinking to themselves, they are surprised. He's asking and he's saying, yeah, you're right. You know, imagine a little boy coming into your classroom and he asks the question, ma'am, what's the sum? You know, I don't know, for example, this divided by this. And then you say, well, the answer is this. He says, yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, that's exactly what happened to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But the man asked another question, follow up question before anyone could say anything. There was another question. What's the question? What is Iman? What is Iman? Now, you and I, if we don't have that knowledge, we wouldn't even know that there is a difference between Islam and Iman, a Muslim and a Mu'min. There is a difference between the two. You wouldn't know if you had not learned. So he asks, what is Iman? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum are surprised. This man is asking in this way. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam responded. And what did he say? He said that Iman is, and he mentions the six pillars, 
tu'mina billah, to believe in Allah, wa malaikatihi, and the angels, wa kutubihi, and the books that were revealed to the messengers, wa rusulihi, and all the messengers that had come down, you need to believe in all of them. Wal yawmil akhir, and the last day. To believe in the last day, wal qadr, and to believe in fate, that good and bad is from Allah. Hulwihi wa murri, min Allah. You know, khayrihi wa sharri, min Allah. The sweet and the sour of destiny or of fate is from Allah. The good and the bad of fate is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to believe, you need to surrender. So these are six pillars. And right at the end, one of the pillars is reiterated. Reiterated. So it sounds like seven pillars, but it's actually six. Let's take a look at it. We say, Aman to Billah. Don't we say, Aman to Billah? I believe in Allah. I believe in Allah. Wa malaikatihi. And the angels. That's the second one. One is Allah, then the angels. Wa kutubihi. Wa rusulihi. Wa liyawmil akhir. Wa qadr. Khayrihi wa sharrihi. Min Allahi ta'ala. And there is one that some people add. They say, Wal ba'ath. Al ba'ath meaning the resurrection. The resurrection and belief in the last day, they are added and put into one because they are all connected to post-death. Do we follow? They are all connected to post-death. So this is why the majority will tell you there are six pillars of Islam. Once in a while you may get someone who will say there are seven. They are still referring to the same six. They are still referring to the same six. The only thing they've done is they've separated belief in the last day and belief in resurrection as two different things. Yet they are both connected to the belief in the life after death. It's connected to life after death. This is something amazing. So he says, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. Again, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum say, Ajibna lahu, yas'aluhu wa yusaddiquhu. We were surprised with this man. He's asking and he's confirming after that. It seems like he knew something. Then he says, tell us, what is ihsan? What is ihsan? Now the Sahaba radiallahu anhum are listening. Some of them may have known, some of them may not have known. They may be in the learning process. And some of them, it was refreshing for them, obviously, to hear this again. So he says, the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-Ihsanu an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. Fa'il lam takun tarahu fa'innahu yarak. Ihsan is a level where you worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. It's a very high level of worship. And if you cannot do that, then at least you worship Allah as though or knowing that He is watching over you. So for example, when I'm fulfilling my salah, I say Allahu Akbar, and I should be feeling, and this is the highest level, that I, I'm seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One might say, well, we don't have a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala besides the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, where she says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi the description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nurun anna yara. He was nur. So we don't have the precise description, but we do know that that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have a very powerful feeling within me that, you know what, I'm, this is for Allah. I feel like I'm a small speck among the huge and numerous creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am putting my head on the ground for Allah. So just picture yourself a little small person in the presence of the huge and numerous creation of Allah prostrating for Allah alone. And if you can't do that, because not everyone is able to do that, then at least you need to know Allah is watching me. That's a beautiful level. I'm sure we can do that. When we say Allahu Akbar, oh Allah is watching me. So I'm beautifying my prayer. I'm beautifying the way I go to ruku because I'm showing off to who? To Allah. That's the only show off in worship that is permissible to Allah. We are not allowed to show off. It's called riya. Riya meaning to, you know, to display, to show off to mankind, to human beings and so on. We are not allowed to show off at all except to Allah when it comes to acts of worship. Remember this. Whenever you're worshipping Allah, when you put on your scarf, make sure. And this is a tough one. Make sure that it is not for the rest of everyone else. And I'm doing it because what will this sister say? And what will the other brother say? And what will so and so? No, I'm doing it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, I might do it in a, in a good way. You know, you don't have to just throw a rag onto your head just as it is. No, you can do it in a good way on condition. If you would like a true reward for it, you need to do it in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
to show off to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, it's tough for me. It's so hard for me. It's very difficult. So many people might look down upon me for as long as you don't, I don't mind. I'm doing it for you. That's what it is. Oh Allah, what I want to do here is for you alone. I'm showing you that I'm worshipping you. When I die, I would like you to take me into your mercy. These are the gems of belief in the hereafter. Why? Because I'm doing something now, firmly believing that I'm showing it off to Allah because He's my maker in the first place and He is the same supreme being that I'm going to return to at the end. So I want to show him, you've sent me here on a mission. What is the mission? To find you, to worship you alone and to do deeds that will please you and abstain from that which you have prohibited. And wherever, wherever I have faulted, I seek your forgiveness. That is part of his plan. He told you that in the instructions, right? When you read the instructions, one, two, three, four, one of them you find, seek forgiveness wherever you have faulted and I will forgive you. Amazing. That is hope. In the hereafter, imagine if Allah says, right, you commit a sin, you're not forgiven. It's over. Even if you ask for it. With us, someone apologizes to us, we say, I don't want, I'm not interested. Apologize, I don't want. Accept the apology, it's okay. If you can, accept it. Allah says it to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and the lesson is for all of us in Surah An-Nur. When his daughter radiallahu anha, Aisha as-Siddiq bint as-Siddiq radiallahu anhuma, when she was accused of fornication or adultery, when she was accused of the crime itself by people who were just hypocrites, rumor mongers, and some of the people spread the rumor. One of those was a man known as Mistah ibn Athatha, radiallahu anh. He fell. He fell into the spreading of tale and rumor. Here comes Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu saying, this man is a relative of mine. He's a poor man. I've been spending money on him. And in return, he's spreading rumor about my own daughter. Minimum is, wallahi, I will never spend on him again. Which means, I'm not going to forgive this man. So Allah revealed verses. وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُولُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ سورة النور Allah says it is not befitting for those with virtue and honor, those whom Allah has bestowed wealth upon and goodness upon, that they say that they will not spend upon those who have made hijrah, the poor, the relatives. Let them forgive. Let them embrace and forgive. For indeed, Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Do you not want Allah to forgive you? Well then, forgive this young man and you will find Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. The lesson I learn from this is when people apologize to me, if I would like the mercy of Allah, I need to accept the apology. I need to accept the apology. When we've demanded an apology, perhaps we may receive it with insincerity. Remember this. When you demand an apology, you may get it very insincere. When it comes without a demand, it is more sincere. Remember this. When we seek the forgiveness of Allah, it is genuine, it is sincere. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are genuine, sincere, you really regret. There is remorse. You admit, I will forgive you. And you know what will happen as a result? When you get to the hereafter, and we're talking about the gems of belief in the hereafter, I promise you that there will be no mention of that sin of yours at all. Even those who recorded it will be made to forgive it. If you did good deeds after having sought forgiveness, no matter what it was, that's Allah's plan. So this is the goodness. Allah keeps us going. He knows we have been created as human beings and He is the one who made us. But at the same time, He says, when you lead your lives, try and worship me in a way that you know I'm watching. That's the lower level of Ihsan. Ihsan is two levels. The lower level is, you know that I'm watching. So what would happen? Would you falter? The reality is no, you wouldn't falter. And if you did, because shaitan keeps trying, shaitan keeps trying. If you did falter, you know Allah is watching and Allah is merciful. He will forgive me for as long as I seek the forgiveness. And through his will and through his assistance, I will not commit the sin again. And if you happen to falter thereafter, a year later, a month later, two years later, five years later, you fall back into the same sin. Don't lose hope. 
go back into the same seeking of forgiveness. You are still alive, aren't you? You know, as they say, the match is not yet over. You can still score a goal, so go and score it. If you are to, for example, witness a match, you might notice one team scores earlier on. It doesn't mean they won the match. You have to wait and see the score at the end. The same applies to our lives. Shaitan might have scored 10 goals and then you score one. It doesn't mean you have lost or Shaitan has won. At the end, you might score 10, 20 goals at once. And what was the score? 11 to Shaitan and 20 to you. What happened? You won. Because at the end, you were the one who scored. When the final whistle was blown, there we are. With us, when the final trumpet is blown, that is how we will be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how you've led your life right now, there is a hadith that says there would be a person who may have led their lives in such a, an outwardly pious way, but at the end, they did such evil deeds and their lives ended in an evil way. They would lose. And what happens with a person who led their lives or people who lead their lives in such an evil way and at the end they seek forgiveness, they are remorseful, they ask Allah's forgiveness, Allah says mercy to them. The example of a person, there is a specific hadith, the example of a particular person, the hadith says 70 years of bad deeds and at the end they did a good deed and Allah granted them Jannah. So gems of the belief in the hereafter, you never know which one of the deeds that you've done with sincerity for the sake of Allah has been loved by Allah to the degree that he grants you paradise, ignoring all the other deeds. That's what it is. Take a look at the hadith of a man who quenched the thirst of a dog, a woman who quenched, for example, the thirst of a cat and so on. There are so many examples and these examples go to show that even though some of these people were really evil in terms of the amount of sin they committed, they had sincerity and they turned to Allah through a deed of compassion. They felt in their hearts, let me reach out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the deed and he says, I looked at this deed and I forgave a person. Now we have one problem. What is the problem? From amongst us, there are those whom shaitan comes to again and says, look, don't worry. Never mind your dress code. Never mind what you do. You can go to the clubs. You can party. You can alcohol. You can adultery. Everything. Just keep a whole load of cats and start feeding them every day. <laughs> yes, that's a misunderstanding. That is absolutely wrong. It is your duty to be the best Muslim possible, the best human being possible. You have one chance. Wouldn't you like to win the match? Today we look at World Cup and we are excited because our team won. We know nobody from the team, but we are more excited than they are. We get so upset, we start crying real tears when they've lost. What about the real match? Let that not distract you from real life matters. The real life, there is, it's not a game actually, but it works somehow similarly in certain aspects of it. The fact that it has a beginning and an end and the fact that whoever scores the most wins. This is something regarding the hereafter. You are alive, my sisters. You are alive. You are breathing. Do you know what? For as long as you're alive, you still have a lot of hope in the mercy of Allah. And don't think that if something has happened, not according to your liking, that Allah dislikes you, hates you. No, He has packaged you a test, as we said in the earlier lecture. He has packaged for you a certain package. He will test you with those tests. They have to come in your direction. You will not be able to chase them away. You have to take them in your stride and you have to do the best given the situation you're in. You have to, you have no option. You know, a day may come when you might be present in a place where something really disastrous happens, whether it is a tsunami, whether it is an earthquake, whether it is some form of disaster created by man or otherwise, and you need to know how to deal with it. You cannot become despondent. You have to have hope in the mercy of Allah so much so that my mothers and sisters, I can tell you, as we grow older, we become weaker. You know that? The peak of age is 40 years. The Quran speaks of al ashud in more than one place, which means the peak. And Allah says that is 40 years. When man gets to the peak of 40 years, which means after 40, at 40 you've arrived at the top of the summit, the top of the mount, and now you're sliding down slowly. Slowly. You cannot deny that. You know, we feel good when we are 60, 70, and someone says, you're looking young. Oh, thank you. Hear that? <laughs> It's an honor to be told you're now looking old, subhanallah. Because why? It's a gem of the belief in the hereafter. You are reminded you're going to Allah. 
when you are told that you are becoming old and you are returning to Allah, do you become depressed? If that's the case, you still need to purify your belief. Don't be depressed. Death is not something evil. It has to happen to every one of us. If death was evil, Allah would not have written it for anyone. But it is written for absolutely all of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All. It's just going from stage one to stage two. You want to graduate from primary school to the university or from secondary school to the university, but you want to still remain in the same classroom. You've got to walk out. That's when you're going to get your graduation, subhanAllah. That's when you're going to be able to go now to the next stage. Walk out. No, I can't walk out. Very bad. That's, what, that's how we look at life as. I don't want to walk out of this life. Allah says, you don't take your own life away. No, suicide is prohibited. We all know that. It's a major sin. A person who commits suicide will not be seeing the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless they were unwell mentally and they didn't know what they were doing. That's between them and Allah. And for this reason, we never judge people who may have committed suicide due to depression because you don't know upon what condition they've died. But at the same time, we will continue speaking about how prohibited it is because life is sacred and it is the ownership of Allah. Not mine and not yours. Remember this, life is so sacred, it's not owned by you, it is owned by Allah. You're not allowed to take it away. You cannot, not even your own life, because your own life is owned by Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember this. And this is where Islam says that it is prohibited to harm yourself. You know, those who are trying to give up smoking, may Allah make it easy for you. It's sad that I have to say this in front of all the mothers and sisters, but sadly I've seen mothers and sisters puffing away like chimneys. My beloved mothers and sisters, it's a bad habit. Give it up. It harms you, doesn't it? If you take a look at some of the packagings of cigarettes that show you, you know, photographs of lungs and little, uh, you know, body parts, it is a disgrace to believe that I'm a mu'min, I believe in Allah, I want to get to the hereafter, and here I am actually trying to harm the same body that is actually not even mine. Allah gave you this body as a uniform, just to be known in this world. Otherwise, it's going to go. That's it. You're going to be separated from the body. You will carry on and the body will probably be buried and it may be decomposed in no time. So we need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept something unique for us. You have hope. You've sought forgiveness. Allah has forgiven you. Believe in your heart. Allah's forgiven me. When you become older and as you become sickly, it has to happen. You cannot remain healthy forever. Things change. They have to change. So if you don't believe properly in the hereafter, you become depressed. You become a person who wants to cling to life at any cost. Any cost. You become a person who wants to defy your age. Don't worry. If people say, Mashallah, this person is aging now. So what? Alhamdulillah. You know, you might not want to say it in a disastrous way. I'm not promoting that you say it to one another. Are you looking old, sister? <laughs> I'm not promoting that you say that to one another. Don't hurt one another. But I am trying to say, become conscious of the fact that you no longer as you were before when you were younger. You no longer. So what you do? Prepare for the meeting with Allah. And how do you prepare for the meeting with Allah? Well, the Quran tells you very clearly, you're looking forward to meeting with Allah. Guess what? Allah is looking forward to meeting with you. Amazing. Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa'a. Whoever loves to meet with Allah, Allah loves to meet with them. Remember this. Surah Al-Kahf, a lot of us read it. We say, oh, Kahfi, mashallah, we read it in Jum'ah. Do you know what it means? Have you read the last verse of Surah Al-Kahf? Allah tells you whoever wants, whoever is looking forward to meeting with Allah. Whoever is looking forward to meeting with their Rabb, the one who made them, who is looking forward to meeting with him. Guess what? Allah says he should make sure that he is doing two things. Then the meeting will be fruitful. Number one. Do good deeds that are acceptable. Al-amal. Amal means a deed, referring to acts of worship. And salih means acceptable, pure, good. What is an acceptable deed? An acceptable deed unanimously, according to the scholars of tafsir and hadith and jurisprudence, 
an acceptable deed or an acceptable act of worship is that act of worship that was taught, instructed, or practiced upon by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's it. So if someone asks you, what is a good deed? A good deed is a deed that was taught, practiced, or promoted, instructed by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That is a good deed in terms of acts of worship. If you have engaged in an act of worship sincerely for the sake of Allah, Allah alone, and it has made you cry and you've become moved by it, but it was not instructed or taught or brought about by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he has not condoned it in any way. Trust me, you've wasted your time preparing for the meeting with Allah. It's going to be a terrible meeting. May Allah not do that to us. So it's not good enough for us to do deeds that are nowhere to be found. In the instruction of the one whom Allah loves so much that He chose him as the best of creation, the most noble of prophets, and to come to us to teach us and instruct us, and we ignore that completely. I've ignored it. I know better than Muhammad. Who was he? I know better than him. I will do an act of worship he didn't do because it makes me cry. It makes me weep. Wallahi, if you go to the non-Muslims, they will also make you weep. They will make you cry. Shaitan can also make you cry. Do you know that? That's not a sign that what you're doing is right. I was moved by it. Being moved by it is not a sign that it was right. You need to know: was it instructed by the most beloved, the one whom I'd like to enter paradise with? If that's the case, don't increase, don't decrease, nothing. Be as best as you can. Remain there. This is something simple, logical. And I always tell people: if you know the Quran, you know the meaning of the Quran. Nobody can fool you. The problem is when you don't know the meaning of the Quran, or you've just heard it and you haven't confirmed it, you may be fooled. People might con you. They might tell you, you know, to get to Allah, you need to go through mediums, and you go through one medium, another medium, another medium. Trust me, the medium itself has no guarantee that it will be in Jannah. Remember this. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala forgive us. I might be standing in front of you. What right do I have to tell you to worship me, to honor me, to do this to me? Who am I? A nobody. That's it. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant us ease. Then the verse continues, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "And let them never associate partners with me in worship, never." So whoever is looking forward to meeting with Allah, you want to go into the hereafter, you want to have a beautiful hereafter, you want to be the queen of queens in the hereafter. Yes, there is a simple method. Surah Al-Kahf. Go and read the last verse. What does Allah say? You are look whoever is looking forward to the meeting with their Rabb. Let them do deeds that were done or taught or condoned, instructed by or that which was brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's number one. Number two is let them never ever associate partners with me in worship. No way. You worship your Maker alone, and this is something unique when it comes to the Muslims. The whole religion is based on the oneness of Allah. That's what makes us monotheistic. That's what makes us different. Why were the polytheists fought at the time of Mecca? If they were correct, there would have been no for, no fighting. There would have been no war, nothing at all. But they were wrong, and not only wrong, they usurped the wealth. They did not live and let live. That is why when they when they drove the Muslimin out of Mecca and they usurped their wealth, the Muslimin came back in order to get it back. This is mine. This was mine. When we were weak and downtrodden, you took it. Now we are prepared to come and reclaim what was legitimately ours. So we believe that we will never render an act of worship for a stick or a stone or a saint or a grave or a tree or an animal or any of the other creatures of Allah. The one who made you is the only one who is fit to be worshipped. That's it. When we say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, what does it mean? There is no one worthy of worship. If you say there is no God but Allah, someone might say you're telling a lie. There are so many gods. So we need to say there is no true God besides Allah. There may be a thousand gods, a million gods, but there is no true God besides Allah. So you don't just translate it literally and say there is no God but Allah. The proper translation comes with a slight bit of an explanation through a word. Worthy of worship, there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. No deity, nothing worthy of worship besides He who made me. Whoever made me, He's the one 
that I worship. That's it. No one else. This is why, and I'm sure you have seen people, you may have seen people declare their shahada as they are entering the fold of Islam, reverting to Islam. What do they say? Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu or wa anna Muhammadan rasulullah. You can say it either way. One is more simple for those who may not be speaking the Arabic language. So I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. This goes back to the core. It shows you that in Islam, the main thing, even to enter the fold of Islam, you need to say, I'm never going to worship anyone or anything but Allah. But we still find ourselves worshiping this one and that one and this saint and that dead man and this grave and this, for example, tree and this. Why? For what? It negates your faith because you are lying that you believe that there is none worthy of worship but Allah because you're worshiping things besides Allah. It's simple as that. Common logic. Don't let shaitan make your belief in the hereafter become shaky. Because then what will happen is when you get there, you might find yourself on the wrong side. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. My mothers and sisters, this is actually a serious topic. It is actually a very serious topic because those who don't believe in the hereafter, for example, there are people who don't believe in the hereafter. There are perhaps those who don't even believe there is a God they become really depressed towards the end of their lives because they actually don't have a clue where they're going. They don't have a clue. At least we're looking forward to something. And we know that, look, today, we're so sophisticated. Do you really think that we were just naturally here? So sophisticated. The clothing you have, the watches you have, everything you have, the perfume you have, the design, you know, the shape you have. Everything, your eyes, your nose, how it works, the, the environment, the motor vehicles you use, and the way Allah has given us the ability, the mind, the brain. When I was flying into this country, I'm looking at the clouds and thinking, subhanAllah, look at the creation of Allah. It's raining here, it's not raining here. Look at how a shadow is created here, this part of the earth. Look at how there are seasons. Look at everything. Look around you. Everything will lead you to the fact that there is a maker. And all Allah is saying is, look, we want you to worship that very maker alone. And you tell yourself, I'm so sophisticated. I have, for example, children, family members, perhaps a bit of wealth, things that are dear to me. Do you really think that suddenly, boom, and everything is gone, gone forever? You're never going to see them. They're never going to see you. And it's all over and gone. Do you really think that? The reality is our lives are too complex and complicated to have just been. Now you're there. Now you're not. You have to be going somewhere where the others whom I've really loved and whom I've really been with, and whom I really care for, will be there as well. That's what it is.